I call this meeting of Committee on Workforce and Business Development Finance and Policy to order. Members, uh, testifiers, and guests, please uh, mute your mics. Uh, this remote hearing is conducted pursuant to Rule 10.01. This remote hearing can be viewed on the House Television webcast. With that, uh, the Committee Legislative Assistant, Mr. Badri, will now take the role. Chair Noor? Present. Chair Noor present. Vice Chair Zhang? Present. Vice Chair Zhang present. Lead Hamilton? Present. Lead Hamilton present. Baker? Baker, Daphne, Daphne, Frankie, Frankie present, Frankie present, Greenman, present, Greenman present, Haley, Haley, Jergens, Jergens. Kegel, Kegel, present, Kegel present, Katiza Watun, present, Katiza Watun present, excuse, Zhang, present, Zhang present, Baker, Baker, Daphne, Daphne, Haley, Haley, Jergens, Jergens. Uh, Chair Noor, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's a quorum present. With that, um, Lead Hamilton, I'm sure you have looked at the minutes for February 21. Uh, do you move a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So moved. Uh, Lead Hamilton moves the approval of minutes of February 21, 2022. Uh, any discussions? See none. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none. The motion prevails. The minutes for February 21, 2022 are now approved. With that, members, today is the Capital Investment Day. This is more for informational hearing. We have many bills and we're gonna to stick to the time frame of less than five minutes. Uh, so to anyone who's testifying, if we cut you off, it's because we wanna make sure that we are on time. Uh, we will start with House File 2680. Chair Schultz, welcome to the committee and uh, please uh, proceed uh, with your bill. Thank you, Chair Noor and members. House File 2680 would appropriate $7.5 million from the general fund to deed to restore and renovate our historic Duluth Armory building. This building has sat empty and unused for decades. So it's really exciting that we finally have a development agreement to restore the armory um, into an economic community and cultural hub for the East Hill side of Duluth and Northern Minnesota. The new armory will honor its past as a military and entertainment hub while really becoming a centerpiece of the region and serve the economic well-being of all. For example, in the drill hall that was once used for military training, it will now be the centerpiece of a vibrant mixed use commercial space with a public marketplace, similar to the Kagan Case Market in St. Paul. Uh, will be filled with a variety of small businesses and will create additional opportunities for entrepreneurs in Northeast Minnesota. The project enjoys very strong support from the area and region. And in your packets, you have a project fact sheet that includes a list of regional community supporters. It's a very long list, as well as the list of artists and musicians from, the around, from around the country who support the Armory Project. And I'm just going to um, refer to my testifier, Chair Noor. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Mark Poirier, and I am the Executive Director of the Army Arts Music Center. And um, we're in a nonprofit that was formed 20 years ago in 2002. And we acquired the Armory in 2003. And since that time, we've invested over $4 million to stabilize the building and make it ready for redevelopment. Some background on the building for context. The Armory was built in 1915 for the Minnesota National Guard and Naval Militia. 
It served as a training center for soldiers and sailors who fought in World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Including in those units was the 125th Field Artillery, who went on to see more consecutive days of combat than any other unit in World War II. The Armory also served for decades as a center for community events and gatherings. There were car shows and home shows, basketball games and boxing matches, concerts and dances. Icons such as Johnny Cash and Patsy Cline and Louis Armstrong performed there, as did Buddy Holly on his third to last show before the fateful plane crash that took his life. And of course, a young Bob Dylan was at that Buddy Holly concert and it changed the course of his life in American popular music. And I could speak for hours about the history, but we only have a few minutes, so let's talk about the future. We have entered into a partnership with George Sherman and Associates to rehabilitate the historic building. With this cooperative agreement, we are going to honor the rich history while updating the armory and reimagining it for future generations. Under the partnership agreement, the building will be redeveloped as an important community space with a focus on economic and entrepreneurial development, arts and culture, and a place where history comes alive. Features in the renovated armory will include a vibrant mixed use commercial spaces celebrating um, the military significance, uh, community kitchens and exhibit spaces. The building will house the North Country Creative Center, an exhibit space that will celebrate the creative spark of the entertainers who are there, including a permanent exhibit dedicated to Duluth native Bob Dylan, showcasing his times to the armory Duluth and Hibbing. Our music resource center, an 11 year old after school music education program for area teens will be housed there as well. We're also working with the Minnesota Military Museum to tell the stories of the men and women of the Northland who passed through these halls while serving our country. In all, this is a $25 million project and we are pulling together a combination of funding sources including new market tax credits, state and federal historic tax credits and grants. A key part of the funding for this project is House File 2680. This $7.5 million allocation from the state combined with our other funding sources will make the vision a reality. As Representative Schultz has said, the project enjoys strong support from key members of our community, including military organizations, businesses, community leaders, and the arts. For too long, the historic Duluth Armory has sat vacant. With your support, we will create a special place that Minnesotans will be proud of. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, with that, um, Chair Schultz, I gather you have another bill to present. I do. I have House File 3062. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor and members of the committee. Thank you for taking the time to hear House File 3062. This is Rep Olson's bill and she's not able to be with us today. This bill would fund repairs and upgrades to the Spirit Mountain Recreation Area in Duluth. Spirit Mountain was established by the legislature in 1973. And as you will hear in more detail from my testifier, the majority of the infrastructure at the facility dates to that time period. Given the advanced age of the infrastructure and the popularity of the destination, there were over 250,000 visitors in 2019, for instance, the time is now to invest in this regional outdoor asset. With me, with uh, today, I have the testifier, uh, Jim Philby Williams. He's the director of property parks and libraries for the city of Duluth. He's gonna provide greater detail on the Spirit Mountain facility and more information on the request. Again, I wanna thank you for this uh, opportunity to consider this project and appreciate um, the time that you're devoting to this committee hearing. And it is really an exciting opportunity to keep Duluth's reputation as an outdoor destination center, destination intact for years to come. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Philby Williams. Thank you, Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. I think we have some technical uh, difficulties there. I can see Mr. Williams on the screen. Opportunities for all Minnesotans, bolster the economy of Northeastern Minnesota and preserve 
Mr. Williams, if you can uh, uh, stop the video and proceed with only the uh, uh, the mic, so so you don't have to get the technical issues that you're experiencing. Fine. And a mountain biking trail system formally recognized among the six best on the planet. Mr. Williams, we still have some audio difficulties. We cannot hear you. If you can just use the audio instead of the video. Mr. Williams? I think members, we do have a technical issue uh, with the presentation and uh, we'll let uh, Chair Scholz maybe go through uh, the bill quickly and um, you have the presentation in your packet. Yeah, online. so thank you, Chair Noor. Um, the significant economic impact of Spirit Mountain, the, in 2019, the total economic impact was 22 million. It created 301 full-time equivalent jobs, and it has over 250,000 annual visitors. Um, it's a destination. 20% of the visitors are from Duluth, 65% um, other areas of, of the state, and 15% come from outstate. Let's see, I'm just gonna skip through the important points. Um, the Spear Mountain, there is a task force that uh, reviews uh, um, Spirit Mountain and advises the city on how best to steer Spirit Mountain in the next 50 years of service. Um, the capital investment request is um, total is $24 million and that would be renovating the main lodge at 11.8 million, replacing the lift and renewal of 3.6 million, uh, adventure park renewal and expansion at 1.9 million, snowmaking system renewal and expansion at 1.2 million, LED lighting conversion at 1 million, campground renewal 0.6 million, general maintenance at 0.9 million, and design and contingency at $3 million. And we're requesting state bonding of 12 million, local government 12 million, so the total investment would be 24 million. And this would lead to after this capital investment, the total economic impact would be 40 million and it would create 506 full-time equivalent jobs. And I, I don't know if we have um, Sam Ritchie, if he wanted to contribute any comments, but with that members, I really uh, am thankful for this time to present both bills and I hope you can support them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Chair Schultz, and uh, definitely these are great programs, and this is the moment for us to invest. Looking forward to uh, making sure that we send the recommendation to the capital investment. The next bill is with Vice Chair Hassan. Uh, that is House File 2839. Welcome to the committee and proceed, Chair Hassan. Vice Chair Hassan. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, <clears throat> I first want to thank you for the opportunity to present House File 2839, an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for the in Indian Health Board Medical and Dental Facility. The Indian uh, Health Board of, of Minneapolis was founded in 1971 and has served the urban community, Indian community for over 50 years. Their wellness campus continues the legacy of service to improve the lives and health of urban Indians. I understand we have a limited time allotted for this, and I'll give up my time um, for Dr. Patrick Rock, the CEO and Medical Director of the Indian Health Board, to explain what this ask is and why this uh, why it's important to fund this project. Thank Dr. you, Rock. Thank uh, you. Very welcome much. to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman, uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, Representative Hassan for her support. And I, of course, I ask the, uh, for everyone's support on this project. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Patrick Rock. I'm a family physician. I've been here at the Indian Health Board going on my 25th year. Uh, we, uh, Indian Health Board, uh, you know, our project is called Minan uh, Diwiwe. It's a part of a, a healthcare campus uh, and it's broken down in three phases. We've already started and, and finished the first phase, which is our behavioral health uh, unit. We've made an investment over uh, over $3 million in that project. Uh, our second phase is the medical and dental facility, which 
is uh, it, what, what, what it is that we're talking about today. Uh, we're asking for uh, $4 million out of a $26 million uh, uh, estimated cost for, uh, for uh, finishing the project. Um, Minan did we weigh, uh, we see that we will you know, expand the number of patients that we're serving here in South Minneapolis and providing an expansion of service, services uh, with that. Uh, a little background on IHB or Indian Health Board. We've been over here, uh, IHB, at, uh, for over almost over 50 years. So we're actually the very first urban Indian health organization in the United States. It started here in Minneapolis, which I'm very happy to say. Uh, we are funded, uh, we are an FQHC, so we're a federally qualified health center, but we also get funding through the Indian Health Service. So we're duly, a duly funded organization here. So that's a big investment here in the South Minneapolis. Um, through through uh, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act under Title V is how we're funded through the Indian Health Service. And it's through that mechanism that the federal, go the federal government provides uh, and oversees its ob treaty obligations uh, to the native population here in, in South Minneapolis. Uh, despite having uh, the sources of funding that I just mentioned to you, uh, we have absolutely no, uh, no access to capital. Everything is basically comes out of our pockets or we find ways to uh, make, uh, make things happen for our organization. So that's why we're here today asking for uh, a little bit of help uh, for, the, for the larger project. Uh, right now, uh, it is, it's commonly known that 78% of Native people live in urban centers. And unfortunately, 1%, um, there's only a 1% of the Indian Health Service budget that goes to uh, urban centers for So it's, there's a huge mismatch. So that's why there's no funding for it. So uh, I know I'm probably running over my time, but I appreciate and uh, appreciate your time. Uh, and thank you. And if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rock, and I appreciate the presentation. Looking forward to the project. Uh, the next bill uh, on the schedule is uh, for Vice Chair Zhang. Uh, you have House File 2998. Uh, please uh, proceed with your testimony and, and also your uh, testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am proudly here today to present House File 2998. 2998, which is the 30,000 Black Art Center. And for those of you who were on the bonding tour this last fall, we had an opportunity to hear from our great folks there about the impact of this institution and how much it would mean to have them uh, have a place here in our city uh, to support our African-American youth in our state. And so without further ado, Mr. Chair, I will let my testifiers share more about this great institution. Uh, welcome, I see, I think Kevin is here to testify on the bill. Uh, yes, Chair, Laura. Well, welcome to the committee. Please uh, yeah. proceed with your testimony, introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Chair Nor. Good seeing you again. Um, and thank you, Vice Chair uh, Jay Zong, uh, Eastside. Just have to say that real quick. Uh, 30,000 Feet is uh, um, uh, was founded by me and Vanessa Young in 2013 uh, to provide creative learning experiences for um, for young people who have um, who, who struggle in a uh, traditional academic setting for K-8 students and also provide a tech apprenticeship uh, opportunities for young people uh, who have previously contact with the juvenile delinquency system or who just have barriers to employment. Um, the, the Black Arts and Tech Center will, 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 um, uh, um, will, will this, this funds will be used to equip, um, furnish and also construction for young people. It will help us double the number of people that we could serve on an annual basis. Uh, we just purchased a building um, right before the holidays to have it right next to uh, Johnson High School. Um, um, the needs by the number. Um, um, last year, Minnesota uh, ranked last um, in young people taking, in high school students taking an AP computer science class uh, in Minnesota, uh, 50 out of 50 states. Um, right now, Minnesota has 14,000 open computing jobs with an average salary of $92,000. So that, that equates about a billion dollars to get left on the table each year. These jobs are not taken up. 
uh, the average family household in that in, in uh, where we're doing the center at is around thirty six thousand um, dollars. So um, it's very important. Um, um, the arts and culture brings one point two billion dollars in into Minnesota every year. We hope to to uh, support community artists in the space. Uh, and provide opportunities to work with the young people, but also as in, uh, independent entrepreneurs. Um, and I just, I just thank everybody for letting me testify today. Um, and hopefully, we get support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rob, uh, Robbins. And uh, I think you mentioned it: fifty out of fifty when it comes to AP Computer Science yes. Uh, yes. nationally. So that that's that's a big <laughs> number for us to overcome. Uh, we're at the bottom, we're at the bottom, uh, uh, Chair North, so we want to go up from here. Well, uh, I think we've got more to do, Mr. Robinson, so yeah. uh, we'll, we'll keep on working on it. Uh, so the next bill is House File 3080. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan, you are on the, uh, on the list again. Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and members. Um, this bill... Uh, <clears throat> Oh, sorry, I have too many bills here. <laughs> Hello again, Mr. Chair and members. I, I present House File uh, 3080, an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money uh, for an ex the expansion of the Native American Community Clinic. NAC is federally qualified uh, health center and uh, also a 501c3 nonprofit clinic located at along the Native American Cultural Corridor on Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis. NAC offers full range of culturally centered health services, including medical behavior, health, dental, and substance abuse programs, regardless of anyone's ability to pay. Uh, with that, I'll ask Dr. Um, Anthony uh, Stately, uh, Executive Director of Native American Community Clinic, to explain uh, this ask. Thank you. Dr. Stately, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, uh, Representative Hassan, um, for your introduction. And also, um, thank you, Chair Noor, for um, giving me some time to speak today. Um, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. I believe that you have, um, uh, the committee was provided a one-pager that I sort of kind of go over a request. But generally speaking, um, I want to just also acknowledge the legislature for, um, I think, the session before last. We were awarded uh, $3.8 million to purchase our property, um, um, which helped us get across the finish line to actually get site control of the property and the land. Um, NAC is proposing to build a brand new clinic on Franklin Avenue, um, right on the uh, cultural corridor, um, which will be an expanded clinical footprint that will allow us to bring all of our services under one roof. Currently, right now, we're separated into about three locations um, in and around Franklin Avenue. And then um, we also are going to build um, um, four to five um, stories, although, um, sorry, three to four floors of housing above the new clinic to sort of do our, do our part in trying to respond to the critical need for um, uh, low income and affordable housing support to major American Indian people in, um, in South Minneapolis and around the Seven County metro area. Currently right now, um, 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 uh, Native Americans represent about one percent. I mean, uh, one out of one out of four Native Americans are uh, represented in the homeless population. So while we represent less than one or two percent of the population total of the state, we are significantly overrepresented in the homeless um, um, uh, population um, dramatically. Um, so. What we're hoping to do is we also happen to notice that um, NAC's um, current sort of uh, menu of services, we provide a lot of outreach services to people living in homeless and um, in encampments and uh, sheltered services. And um, we've, um, over the last three or four years, we've built up very strong, robust partnerships with a number of um, uh, folks that have um, been serving and providing services to people living in unsheltered situations um, as a direct result of our involvement in the, um, the Wall of Forgotten Natives, which, um, you know, if you um, were around in 2018, you know that that was the largest homeless encampment of Native people ever in the state of Minnesota, and actually the largest homeless encampment ever in the state. Um, so we're trying to do, we, we recognize that um, homelessness together with um, infectious disease and opiate um, overdoses, which is where we do a lot of our work within our, within our integrated um, behavioral health clinic and our medical clinic, 
and substance abuse treatment services that is that a critical sort of point of focus here is um, around that specific confluence of, uh, of, of problems. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work in this area and making a lot of headway, but one of the things we need is we need a big, we need a modern clinic and we need um, more, more clinical footprint to be able to serve more people. Um, I'm not sure um, that um, your committee members may not know this, but Minnesota, specifically South Minneapolis and the Twin Cities is home to the largest and most densest urban population of Native Americans in the entire country of the United States. Um, that has been true for um, a number of decades and it continues to be true today. Um, NAC serves, our patient population is about 85% Native American, although we serve all populations and we serve anybody who walks through our front door. That's one of our um, mission um, critical things and it's also a requirement for us in a um, federally qualified healthcare center. Um, and so one of the things that we hope to do is um, I think one of the things I want to just draw your attention to that this is part phase two of a, of a two part, um, uh, two phase project that has always been true in our first um, uh, uh, pass at the legislature a couple of years ago, we had and, um, let you all know that we would ask for support during the, during phase two. Um, the overall project is about $39 million and we're asking for about 12 million in support. We put together all of the rest of the funding together um, through new market tax credits and some low, in low income housing tax credits and a number of other funding strategies, both private philanthropy, public and, um, and otherwise. And like Dr. Rock had mentioned, <clears throat> because we are, um, we are not funded through Indian Health Service, we are funded solely through HRSA, the Health Corps, Health Resources and Services Administration. And the majority of our funding um, comes from competitive grants uh, and a few other things that we've been able to do um, very well over the last three or four years. We've expanded our grant portfolio and our services um, um, about threefold over the last four years. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stately. Uh, appreciate that. And we will certainly consider all these uh, bills that are before us today. Uh, with that, the next bill is House File 3191. Chair Lily, welcome to the Workforce and Business Development Committee. Please uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair uh, and uh, um, Vice Chair uh, Zhang and Lead Hamilton and uh, the rest of your committee. Thank you for uh, thanks for having us uh, today. At uh, um, Tubman East is uh, is a fantastic program. They've been uh, working for about forty five years and they serve about twenty five thousand people a year. And uh, what they're doing is they're helping people of all genders and races and cultural backgrounds who've, uh, you know, experienced some, some bad stuff going on in their life, uh, whether that be uh, a violence at, you know, in their homes or um, sexual exploitation, homelessness, uh, addiction, mental health, and trauma. And they've been doing a great job of, of working on this. And so the House File um, um, 3191 essentially is to, to do some work on the building. They've been recipients in the past of bonding and they've been great stewards. So uh, I have no doubt that they'll be able to do that again. And uh, uh, Tu Zhang, uh, one of your committee members is on the bill as well. And uh, thank you for doing that and authoring this. And, uh, and uh, I mean, but this is, they're serving people all over the Metro. With me today, I have the CEO, um, uh, Ms. Polson. And uh, I was just wondering if she could take over, Mr. Chair, and just kind of uh, get into the, be the details of what they're doing and uh, what they're hoping to do with this bill. But thank you for your time, sir. Uh, thank you. Ms. Paulson, welcome to the uh, committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and thank you, Representative Lilly. I'm Jennifer Paulzine, the CEO of Tubman, and I really appreciate this opportunity to share more uh, with you about our request for these capital investment funds. Uh, services, as, as you just heard, our services include domestic violence emergency shelter, on-site transitional housing for trafficked youth, legal services, mental health therapy and substance abuse treatment, youth services, jobs, education, and economic advancement support. It's important that you know that all Tubman programs are designed with, by, and for BIPOC survivors using a racial equity lens. 
And the public benefits of this project are both economic security and community safety. Harriet Tubman Center East is a 57 year old, 110,000 square foot, historically significant building in Maplewood. And to expand our programs to serve a growing number of clients, we have to invest in capital improvements. Those improvements include the addition of a public elevator to assure universal accessibility uh, to our services, both for people with disabilities, but also uh, while preserving the safety and confidentiality of all of our facility users, particularly victim survivors in our on-site shelter and housing programs. It's the completion of some fire sprinkling, it's a partial roof replacement, electrical upgrades and energy efficiency improvements. It's the replacement of windows in our shelter and housing wing, which is also a COVID uh, mitigation strategy. It is the construction of an on-site pet shelter because nearly half of domestic violence survivors delay leaving an abusive situation because they are fearful for their pet safety. It's also a commercial kitchen. There's a 12,000 square foot commercial kitchen space on site. We're in a feasibility study to determine how to transform that space into a usable kitchen that will provide training and employment opportunities for survivors of domestic violence um, and really determine the best business model moving forward, whether that be space rental for small food-based businesses, a livable wage training program, or a long-term lease option. Um, and how is this request related to workforce development? It's really, um, this issue affects so many. Domestic violence affects one in three women and one in six men. 75% of victims are under age 24 and two thirds of homeless families are homeless because of domestic violence. The National Network to End Domestic Violence reports that 99% of victims experience economic abuse, which limits their ability to secure and maintain jobs and housing and makes them more likely to fall into a cycle of reliance upon public benefits and low wage work. These challenges disproportionately impact the marginalized communities that we serve due to the additional barriers caused by structural racism. So given all of those correlations, economic stability is central to Tubman's mission. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and I really want to thank you for your time and consideration of this request. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Ms. Paulson, for your testimony. I think I'm getting an echo from your back end. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, appreciate all the work uh, that you do for all of us and uh, looking forward to uh, making sure that this bills uh, are forwarded to the capital investment uh, to be considered for inclusion, uh, but for now it's more informational hearing. So we'll now move to the next bill. Uh, Vice you, Chair, Chair Jay Jong. Oh, go ahead, uh, Chair Lil. No, I just want to say thank you, and uh, I just uh, thank you for consideration of this project. But uh, going through the, you just have some amazing projects, uh, like thirty thousand feet, Conway, Smalley Museum. I just, you know, uh, we're gonna have some, just some great, great projects. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Lily. The next uh, bill uh, for informational hearing is House File 3397, Vice, Vice Chair Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 3397 is a bill seeking funds for the Senate Foundation to repair, upgrade, and renovate the Conway Rec Center. Many of you in this body from both sides of the aisle uh, within the last few years have had an opportunity to visit this great institution including Minority Leader Dowd, our Senate colleague, Senator Pratt, Governor Walls, and even First Lady Joe, Dr. Joe Biden. This wonderful institution is led by uh, former MLS soccer star, Tony Sana. The Sana Foundation continues to serve thousands of Minnesotans, especially during this pandemic, from giving out food to families in need to helping students learn and grow. I couldn't be more prouder than to have uh, such a great nonprofit in my organization, um, leading the way for to help meet our goals of uh, more equitable learning environments for all students. I testify today as uh, the one and only Mr. Tony Sana, who will share more about this great institution and the work that he's doing, Mr. Chair. 
Mr. Senna, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the kind word, Representative Zhang, as, as our champion in our community. Um, I'm going to try to keep this short to the three minutes. We've, we've gotten a previous investment from the state at $4.5 million in bonding in 2018. We raised an additional $6.4 million to build um, a $10 million facility. Um, on the recent bonding tour, people can see how we stretched the money and, and, and did well for the community. Um, it's been it's been incredible now um, the amount of people that are coming through there we're having about 150,000 visitors a year um, some of the population that we didn't really realize was um, the kids that are 18 to 24 are actually using the park a lot um, so that a lot of young kids in our area that did not go to college are still looking to stay active and they're doing it as a positive place we also find people 55 to 70 especially in the Hmong community on the east side are playing um, soccer and a lot of different games that I'm that I'm learning about, um, but it's been a community gathering space. Um, we're looking for a 1.5 million dollars in in this bill to finish renovating this. Um, we had a fire, um, and then with also the the excess people coming because it's so popular, we need to upgrade our parking structure um, as the neighborhood is becoming overrun because. Um, you can't park within three blocks of, of it because so many people are coming to the park. It is in a residential neighborhood, which is great that it's safer, but it's also sort of a hazard when parking is, is that tough to the local residents, and we don't want that to be a, a challenge. Um, we, we look to uh, continue to repair roof, but really um, focus on the lighting, the parking, um, the fencing and to really make it safer for the youth in this community. So um, parents can drop their kids off and come back seven hours later and the kids learn and are mentored through a multi-generational system. So thank you um, chair for giving us this opportunity. We feel that we've always um, did our part on our promise and been great stewards of the investment and belief in us. And we hope that you continue to do so and we will continue to do our part. I would add that since COVID, you know, this building has acted as a school when schools closed down. So we housed 72 kids for, for nine months um, and did virtual school there. So parents that had to work and had no other option. And we were planning to do it again in case there's a strike in St. Paul. And we also serve nutritional services. So we did not do food before this. And we've served over 3 million pounds of food um, since COVID started. And um, this center is also a food nutritional service for the community as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sane, for your testimony. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can have a soccer tournament for members uh, so that we can enjoy and you can help us with that uh, during the spring. Uh, so thank you so much uh, with that. Um, the Mr. next Mr. bill. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Mr. Sane. It is open all day to the community and it's not far from the Capitol. So we have plenty of seniors that come. And if you ever want to just exercise and walk and be healthy or have walking meetings, it's open every day at 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. So come and exercise and have some healthy meetings. It's an open challenge, members. I will have a soccer okay, tournament. Mr. Chairman. We'll no, sorry, Mr. Time. Chairman. I got a chuckle. I think he just called you and I and everybody else a bunch of seniors, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I hear that. So we're willing to challenge him uh, on a soccer tournament. So <laughs> members, let's get ready. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sun and uh, Lead Hamilton. Um, so, the next bill is House File 3419. Um, Chair Gomez, welcome to the committee. Please introduce your bill and proceed. Thank you. My chair, Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? Your, your yeah. audio isn't clear. All right, I'm using my alternative audio. Much better. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chair Noor, Vice Chair uh, Jean Jay, and Lead Hamilton members for having me in front of your committee today. I'm pleased to be presenting House File 3419, which is an appropriation to the Cultural Wellness Center of $3 million to support um, them building um, Dreamland on 38th. <clears throat> My testifier is going to go into detail on the project. Are you hearing that feedback? Yes, but you can continue. Sorry, maybe that's better. Um, yeah, so the Cultural Wellness Center has really just been an anchor in the South Minneapolis community for decades. 
Um, they lead us on community wellness and community development initiatives that place culture at the center of the work. Um, and this allocation would allow them to, to physically anchor one of our um, cultural corridors in Minneapolis, which were designated by the city over the last couple of years. So this, this particular one is on 38th Street, which is you know, historically the heart of the African-American community in Minneapolis because of restrictive covenants in other areas of the city. This was the first community in which Black families were able to buy homes. And so this initiative really, you know, um, honors that history and, and, and centers the cultural assets of our community in this uh, community development resource and jobs training facility. So I would love to welcome my testifier, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, Chair Gomez. I see Anthony Taylor. Yes, Mr. 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 Taylor. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, as always, and uh, Representative Gomez. Thank you. It's it's great to see you both, um, and it's exciting that I can honestly say I always see you both in community. It is um, a great uh, privilege to serve with you. Um, so thank you all. The the Cultural Wellness Center is a 25 year old institution serving in South Minneapolis, Dreamland and 38th. Um, and, and this is in some regards a report back um, to say thank you to this body for the initial investment uh, that you made in pre-design, pre-development for it. There's $250,000 that allowed us to actually lay the foundational work and get to here. We have launched our Dreamland on 38th project as a really robust $10 million capital campaign um, that will actually be leveraged by uh, this investment. Uh, the building and project itself, um, it, I think we started out as thinking about it as a building, is leveraging our work um, starting in the global market where we're offering specific support to African-American entrepreneurs and a specialty in the fact that many cultural entrepreneurs begin with food-based businesses and that it is the most difficult space to step into simultaneously. So we have actually developed a very specific strategy around using culture as an asset, offering the unique support to food-based businesses in the African-American community, and we are calling this um, culinary heritage, um, that this will be anchored from our 10,000 square foot project on 38th. Dreamland itself is a nod to the historical Dreamland Cafe opened by Anthony B. Cassius in 1938. It was uh, the anchor of what would soon become the economic and district uh, and the vital, vi vital economic community uh, of South Minneapolis, anchoring in African-American culture. We also uh, are very clear in that this project has become more than a building, that we see this work on 38th and Dreamland on 38th as a regional effort. Uh, this will be the first of that project, um, really leveraging the work that has begun in Sabathony and moving all the way down to what we come, what we now know as George Floyd Square. And again, uh, focusing on job creation, economic vitality, and really culture as an asset. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and am prepared to answer questions related to uh, this project. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taylor, for your uh, testimony. Um, it's uh, also wanted to say thank you to Chair Davney for bringing the uh, the racial component, uh, you know, bill that we passed, and especially during this uh, Black History Month. So thank you so much. I look forward to the projects that we're hearing today. Uh, the next bill uh, is it's by Chair Moran. Um, Madam Chair, welcome to the committee, which you're also a member of, and uh, please uh, proceed. Well, um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I too want to thank you for allowing me to present on House File 3371. Um, and so, um, so Keystone Community Services requests is for $4 million in state funds to construct and renovate their acquired site on University Avenue uh, here in St. Paul and serve Ramsey County with access to healthy food and other services. Uh, one in 11 Minnesotans were experiencing food insecurity in 2019. The number increased to one in nine in 2020. Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous Minnesotans are twice as likely to experience food insecurity as white Minnesotans. The need for food shelf support continues to rise with there being 50, a 50% increase 
in a participation at Keystone sites from August to October of this year. Keystone current basic need program supports a low income population with 77% of the participating of the participants identifying as a, a color a community of color with a wide array of ethnic communities. There are 27 different languages represented last year. Um, this project, and I'm going to be sure because I know we have a great testifier here, but I want to say that this, pro this project is a great holistic, comprehensive approach to food insecurity, housing, homelessness, and support for all located on the bus line in the light rail when ready to go. With that, I pass that on to Chair Noor to um, testify. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, I see Mary uh, McKeon. Yes, Mary, please, well, please introduce yourself and proceed uh, with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Noor, uh, and thank you members of the committee for the opportunity to share our community food site project with you. And thank you to Representative Moran for sponsoring our bill. Uh, for the record, my name is Mary McEwen, and I'm the president of Keystone Community Services. Keystone is a human service organization with 80 plus years of experience in providing basic needs, senior programs, and youth enrichment programs. In 2021, Keystone provided support for over 42,000 low-income people. And as Representative Moran said, 77% of those uh, come from communities of color. We are also the largest food shelf provider in the East Metro area, serving over 32,000 people every year with food resources. We offer that support via two food shelf locations currently. We have two food mobiles that go out into the community to senior high rises, libraries, local colleges. Um, and we have a grocery delivery program started during the pandemic. And then we also do large scale food distributions for members that need uh, easier access to food shelf resources. House file 3371 requests a capital investment of $4 million for a 20,000 square foot community food site that Keystone purchased at the end of 2020 that will support 50,000 people with healthy food. Nearly 65% of the people living in Ramsey County who live in poverty. We are currently operating out of four very small sites with no options for adding more space. Right now, our sites are only able to accommodate 20 volunteers per day who provide critical support for our services. The new site will make it possible for us to use 50 volunteers today to get these food resources out into the community. We will also be able to double the amount of food that we're able to distribute. We get food from Second Harvest, we get food from local grocery stores, from farmers markets, and we will be able to take that distribution number from 2 million pounds per year to 4 million pounds and more. And that also includes federal commodities and other household items that we just simply don't have the room to store and distribute right now. The new community food site will also function like a community center on University Avenue with more room to offer community programming with other organizations like Keystone, a much larger food market area, and a large warehouse area that allows us to store food and other donated household items. The garage on site will also house our two food mobiles. Uh, this new site will revitalize a section of University Avenue right near the Fairview light rail station. As Representative Moran mentioned, the need for food services continues to rise. And even prior to the pandemic, it was going up at 10% a year at Keystone. In the last quarter of 2021, we provided food resources for 2,200 new participants. These are folks that had never come to a food shelf. And that's double the number of people we, we provided new services to at the end of 2020. So the need continues to rise. It's also rising in our older adult population. As I mentioned in 20, 2019, we supported 1,700 older adults with food supports. In 2021, we served nearly 4,500 older adults with food supports. The need is continuing. But on average, and this is something that most people don't know, food shelf participants at Keystone only come three times a year. They're coming when they're in financial distress, when they have an unexpected car repair, 
when they have some a healthcare bill that's higher than, than they expected, when they're moving to a new home or a new apartment and need more resources. They use the food shelf as a place to get those food resources during that time of financial distress. And using a food shelf helps people stay in their homes. It helps them stay housed and it helps them maintain their family stability, particularly for older adults and also for people with young children. The total project cost is $8.5 million. And in the last 18 months, Keystone has raised $3.2 million for the project, including nearly $1 million of support from the city of St. Paul. And we are continuing to raise support from our community. Our community has overwhelmingly supported this project and participants have been involved in the design of the site since its inception. The investment of $4 million will allow us to start construction on the site in September and so we can get more food resources out in 2023 to more people and support that increasing number of people that need this support. Thank you for your support of this bill and thank you for supporting people in our community that need food resources. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony, Ms. McEwen, and also to uh, Chair Moran. So thank you so much. The next bill that we have is uh, does not have a number yet. It's uh, Representative Frederick. Welcome to the committee and please uh, introduce your bill. Thanks, Chair Nero. Uh, I'm Representative Luke Frederick and uh, my bill is gonna get introduced tomorrow officially. Uh, but one of the, last year's one of the things that I was an absolute privilege to do was carry a bill that uh, helped fund access to children's museums throughout the state. It, the, the funding was specifically designed to get people who may not have been able to afford to be able to access their local children's museums to be able to get them through the door. This year, I'm super excited to be able to uh, partner up with a coalition of Greater Minnesota Children's Museums so they can not only have more people uh, have access to what they do, but they wanna be able to provide more. Uh, and so there's six different children's museums uh, in greater Minnesota from St. Cloud to Rochester, Bemidji, Mankato, uh, that are coming together to form an ask uh, that we can help them fund capital improvements. Now, each site is a little different in what they're specifically advocating for. Uh, Mankato in my district is looking to renovate some of their existing space, but then actually add on, have another building uh, where they're able to provide more different learning and exciting experiences to the communities that they serve. Mankato's Children's Museum, it doesn't just serve Mankato, right? It is a regional asset. We hear about people coming up from even Iowa uh, to come up and, and to, uh, hang out and not even just Iowa, but from all over. And that's kind of a similar story that we've heard from children's museums throughout the state. They're amazing experiences uh, that that kids and adults uh, enjoy. And I would uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Or, uh, Cameron Kruger from the Duluth Children's Museum uh, at your discretion, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kruger, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor and members of the committee. And uh, thank you, uh, Representative Frederick, for that extremely enthusiastic uh, introduction and uh, for authoring our bill. We're pleased by that. Uh, my name is Cameron Kruger. I'm the president and CEO of the Duluth Children's Museum. And uh, as Representative Frederick had alluded to, um, I'm representing a coalition of Greater Minnesota Children's Museums. And I'm going to read those off to you so you know the breadth and depth of, of the uh, children's museums in our state that are involved with this. Um, they are the Children's Museum of Southern Minnesota in Mankato, Great River Children's Museum in St. Cloud, the Judy Garland and Children's Museum in Grand Rapids, Otter Cove Children's Museum in Fergus Falls, Wonder Trek Children's Museum in Brainerd Baxter, the Spark Children's Museum in Rochester, and the Duluth Children's Museum. Uh, children's museums are where children can learn through play and exploration. Uh, with exhibits and programs, field trips, and special events, our museums are community hubs for both informal and standards-based learning that engage kids and caring adults. Each of these museums reflects in the experiences that they provide what is unique about each of our communities, highlighting local history, industries, and cultures. Uh, my own museum, we use Ojibwe language learning as a big part of our exhibit structure, and uh, each museum provides that kind of cultural learning in um, their centers. Our request of 36 million uh, represents an investment in playful learning and early childhood development for all children. 
Funds will be used to meet critical infrastructure needs, uh, which allow each of these children's museums to better meet the needs of their communities, while also providing five times the economic return uh, through direct, indirect, and induced spending, as well as job creation. Together, our museums serve nearly 500,000 children and families uh, annually, including visits from every Minnesota county. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, children's museums have become an even more critical community asset serving families, particularly those families in need, as many now seek educational opportunities outside of their homes and outside of the schools. The last few years have also raised the importance of interactive outdoor spaces, um, which a lot of these proposals uh, have uh, adding using this infrastructure funding um, at our children's museums. And as tourism drivers in the communities that we serve, our visitors also come from across the United States and from around the world. When families with children are deciding on their travel plans, children's museums are a highlight of a family-friendly destination. Support for this bill is an investment in the future of Minnesota children. And I thank you so much for your consideration of our bill. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kruger, and also uh, Representative Frederick. Looking forward to getting that bill uh, introduced tomorrow. So, uh, you know, with kids uh, who have enjoyed the Children's Museum, I look forward to seeing that more kids are being served. So thank you so much. And the next bill on the schedule is the, uh, they're all both for Representative Hassan. They don't have a bill number. I think the initial one is the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative. So please uh, uh, proceed, Vice Chair Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Minority Lead and members. It's me again. I have uh, multiple bills today. Uh, my bill will be introduced tomorrow as well. And this bill appropriates money for the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative. The Urban Indigenous um, Legacy Initiative is a collective of 16 renowned Native American nonprofit organizations in the Twin Cities focused on issues ranging from healthcare to housing, workforce development to childcare that have provided our communities with powerful and effective services for more than four decades. With that, Mr. Chair, I have, uh, I'll let Marissa Cumming, the president and CEO of Minnesota Indian Women's Resource explain the project. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself, Mr. Kuming, uh, Madam, Ms. Kumings, and uh, please introduce yourself to the committee and proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor and members of the committee, and thank you, Representative Hassan, for your introduction. Um, my name is Marissa Miyakanda Cummings, and I'm the President and CEO of the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center and representing the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative. And I believe you've all been provided a one-pager on our initiative. Um, our organizations collectively provide education, workforce development, direct health care, behavioral health services, homeless and housing services, as well as Indian child welfare and much more for our communities. Rather than compete against one another for capital improvement funds, we have banded together for a collective ask that will allow us to provide a comprehensive delivery of services to uplift our community. One of the 16 organizations is the Native American Community Clinic that um, Dr. Stately presented before. So by supporting this bill, you will also be supporting NAC's request for capital investment. The Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center is located in the Phillips neighborhood on the south side of Minneapolis and is part of the American Indian Cultural Corridor. Our mission is to empower American Indian women and families to exercise their cultural values with integrity and to achieve sustainable life ways while advocating for justice and equity. We provide a full range of culturally relevant services from mental health and behavioral health services, housing, social services, and prevention and intervention community-based programming, as well as outreach services to victims of sex trafficking and sexual assault. Our current building is 67 plus years old and has structural issues. We currently have water leaking in our basement from the current snow melt as it has for the last 18 years. We have carpet that is paper thin and held together with duct tape, literally. And our top two floors offer housing to low-income tenants, and we do not have a sprinkler system in place. Our pipes are so old that we have sewage leaks from the upstairs apartments at least twice a year. And these funds will allow us to remodel our top two floors and meet building codes and regulations. Approving this bill will allow us to have adequate facilities to provide much needed services to our community. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and civil unrest of the past two years have highlighted the disparities that continue to burden 
the urban indigenous community. There simply are high levels of need and um, we're grappling with aging and capacity limiting facilities. I would also like to point out that the Phillips neighborhood has the highest rate of opioid overdoses in the state of Minnesota. We have come together to seek 85.5 million in state funding to construct 12 new culturally um, appropriate buildings that will allow us to address disparities by expanding services, creating safe, empowering experiences for those we serve. And we call it the Legacy Initiative because it is part of a collaborative um, group that has never been formed before. And we hope that this type of momentum will go forward into the future. So with this, I will be happy to answer any questions related to the bill at this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Cummings, and uh, for your presentation. All these great programs that we're hearing today, and also to uh, Vice Chair Sand for bringing this bill forward. Uh, looking forward to the conversation uh, as we proceed. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan, you do have another bill uh, for the Somali Museum in Minneapolis. You're, you're muted. You would think after three years, we've learned how to unmute ourselves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I promise this is the last bill, uh, but certainly not the least. Um, the next bill um, also has not been introduced. It will be introduced tomorrow. It's an act relating to capital investment appropriating money for the Somali Museum in Minneapolis. Somali Museum is home uh, of, is the home of the traditional uh, Somali arts in Minnesota, displaying a collection of over 700 pieces. And I think that may be an old information. Uh, someone will correct me. I think uh, it's more than 700 pieces and offering educational programs about Somali traditional culture that are not offered anywhere else. The importance of this uh, institution is impactful. Um, I remember, you know, a few years ago, I have taken my son and his friends, um, all kids who were born in Minnesota, some are Somali descent, some are not, to visit the Somali Museum. And um, there was, uh, you know, different artifacts, but the most, uh, you know, the one thing that blew their mind was something that's called Akal Somali. It's Somali traditional hut. And I told them that, you know, when we were in the refugee camp, this is where we stayed. And these kids could not believe they're like, where do you sleep? Where do you cook? How do you move around? And I also told them there was nine of us, 10 of us. So uh, with that, I have two testifiers, uh, Nawal Noor, founder and CEO of Noor Companies and Osman Ali, the founder and the executive director of Somali Museum, who will help us, um, you know, explain this project better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nur. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself and uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor, and thank you, Representative Hassan. Um, I'm so happy to hear Representative Hassan has had um, her son experience. My kids have experienced it, and there's nothing like it for our community, especially for kids that have been born here. It is my pleasure to speak with you this uh, afternoon about the Somali Museums project. My name is Noel Noor. I'm the CEO of Noor Companies. Uh, we're the developer for the Somali Museum. This project has been in the works for more than 10 years. Um, the museum is housed in Lake Street today in South Minneapolis. The museum is an organization with incredible assets to, this, to the state of Minnesota and to the entire United States and to the world. It's the only kind, um, the museum of its kind. The organization has had so much support uh, for this project and um, its inception, even in the unrest of Lake Street, uh, when the artifacts were um, evacuated from the Somali Museum. Um, it has the support of all the neighborhoods adjoining the, uh, the neighborhood, the in educational institutions that it presents to public and private partners, including the Minnesota History Center, which houses uh, half, if not more than half of the artifacts because they, they are not able to house it in the current space that they have. We're so excited to develop this project for the, this important institution. The, the museum has the largest East African artifacts and parallel in the world. Um, it serves the museum itself to, today. It serves the Minnesotans um, and, and outside of Minnesota. People come from all over the world to visit the museum. 
It is a place for providing education about Somali culture, as Representative Hassan said, to the community, to cult, to schools, to corporations, to public entities. The museum was, will also continue in this new place that we're, we're trying to develop to be a place that serves for cultural training, a place that provides education for and production for weaving and youth and elderly to connect to the history of the Somali community. It's going to be an accessible place in, place for education groups, uh, such as schools that do visit the museum today, a community space for gathering, a place for, that provides workforce development. Um, and we are um, excited to have a place that actually houses the entire artifact collection instead of just multiple places. The project is expected to cost $18 million. We're asking for $10 million. The rest of the project sources will be Newmark's tax credit, public and private philanthropy, some of which the museum has raised so far. Uh, so let's talk about the, the museum itself. We are um, in the discussion of two spaces, one of which is in Minneapolis. Uh, we expect to have 51,000 square feet um, the space is going to have um, performing arts, textile exhibition, um, workforce development center, and a studio. Um, it is at the corner, the place that we're looking at right now is at the corner of Minnehaha and 26th Street. Uh, we're asking for your support, and uh, I will hand it off to uh, the executive director of the Somali Museum. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Mr. Ali, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself and briefly uh, speak to the, uh, to the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Osman Ali. I'm the director and the, I'm the executive director and the founder of the Somali Museum of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair Noor and the board member and the committee members. Thanks for uh, Hodan. And, we are leaders with one of kind museum in the state of Minnesota, and the museum is located right now in a basement of retail building in Lake Street since 2013. We have 300 items displayed now, and 1,091 valuable and unique artifacts in different storage. We do not have the space right now to display all our artifacts and properly describe each piece. The new facility will allow us to create a workforce aspect, community gathering space, and increase knowledge for the people of Minnesota on Somali culture and create permanent exhibitions. We do have programs like dance troupe, weaving classes, mobile shows, Somali Culture 101, storytelling, and more. We host every year more than 5,000 people around the year and diff from different programs and community events. It's very difficult for a museum to be in a lease space and that's why we are asking for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ali. Looking forward to uh, enjoying more uh, of the Somali Museum if we can get anything done during this session. Uh, with that, the next bill is Representative Raya. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and your bill, House File 3221. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members. It's good to be back in front of you today. Um, I'm especially glad to be here to sponsor House File 3445 for We Win Institute. This bill requests uh, $1.5 million in funding for build building facilities. I've known and admired We Win and its founder, uh, Executive Director Titi Lao Beriaco, for many years. I particularly have appreciated the positive approach of We Win's programs and the results they achieve with the families and the children they serve. We Win is a place of pride, energy, and love that counters the corrosive effects of structural racism and anti-Blackness, all without a permanent place to call home. This bill seeks to address that gap. Uh, so time is short, so now let's hear from our testifiers who have so much more to share about this excellent organization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Raya. I see uh, Nikima Levy uh, Armstrong. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you for having me. I'm Nikima Levy Armstrong, civil rights attorney and activist 
and a huge fan and supporter of We Win Institute. Um, many of us know that during the pandemic, there was a lot of turmoil, chaos, stress impacting our community. Rather than shy away from those concerns, T.T. Bidiaco and the staff of We Win Institute went right to work creating a food delivery program for uh, Black families, low-income Black families and children, um, creating We Win When We Read, which has literally given away thousands of children's books by Black authors to children across the Twin Cities, uh, and also uh, providing curricular support as well. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, outside of the pandemic, We Win Institute um, focuses on academic support, specifically for Black children, but they welcome all children who come through the door. They um, have uh, Black storytellers who are present. They also offer drumming, um, spoken word, um, and other ways of expressing our culture to counteract a lot of the issues that impact Black children in our community, as well as to fill in some of the gaps of what our children may not be receiving through their uh, traditional classroom settings. And so this is an, an incredible investment, an incredible opportunity for an institute that is a pillar in our community. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Livy Armstrong. And uh, I, Representative Rao, you do have another testifier in the bill? That's correct, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, shall please introduce yourself uh, to the committee and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Persigal, and I am a an active volunteer with We Win. Um, uh, we want to just mention that the reason that Titi Lyo Bediaco is not here today to testify for um, the organization is she is out of the country. So Nakeem and I are here on her behalf. Um, we Win is an amazing organization that's been around for 25 years, um, serving students and, and their families uh, throughout Minneapolis. It's a Black-centered organization that lifts up and celebrates Black culture, Black excellence, Black joy. And the mission of We Win is to focus on the academic and social success of all children. Um, the reason that this is so important at this time is because We Win has never had a building of its own. It has created space and place for students and families to come together without brick and mortar of its own. And this bill would enable us to purchase our own um, building and to create that continuity and that safety and that um, environment of celebration and affirmation in physical form for all of our children, youth, and families. And so we thank you for considering this will make a huge difference and will continue to support the life and vitality of, of, of thousands of, of students and their families in the Minneapolis area. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Persigal, and for your testimony and that great program that uh, the We Win runs. Uh, looking forward to making sure that we uh, invest in places that are going to yield a better result. So thank you so much uh, for your testimony. With that, I appreciate Representative Rye for bringing this bill forward. And uh, I don't know if there, uh, you know, if we're going to be missing other bills. But now it's for uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, you have House File Thirty Two Twenty One. Initially, I said it was for Representative Rye. It, uh, it's your bill. Uh, please uh, welcome to the Workforce and Business Development Committee and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, it's a privilege and honor to be here. And I, I, I almost did jump in on Representative Ryer's uh, uh, bill, but uh, I, I, I caught myself just in time. You made my day, uh, I have to say, Mr. Chair. I mean, for me to be able to be in the same space, although she's here in spirit at, at the moment, is Tita Lyle, uh, someone I've known for, good God, decades. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 Ms. Levy Armstrong and Director Osman Ali, doing just, you know, amazing work. Um, but I'm here for House File 3221. It's a $7.5 million capital investment request for the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living, or MCLI. Uh, the request is to uh, renovate and expand uh, a current facility that provides uh, direct service and training 
in the northern part of my district, um, uh, just north of, of downtown uh, St. Paul. Uh, the majority of the people served uh, by this um, uh, terrific uh, uh, um, organization are people of color, indigenous uh, people, um, as are the majority of the providers, uh, the emerging uh, professionals and caregivers. Um, this organization is also part of a movement uh, that's uh, Minnesota, but it's also national. And in many ways, they're a state and national leader in furthering the quality skills of PCAs, including driving how to do quality certification programs for PCAs, all leading to economic justice outcomes by moving those in the field uh, to be able to command living wage work. Um, with that, Mr. Uh, Chair members, I'll turn over the rest of this presentation uh, to my good friend and uh, Director, Mr. Jesse Beth. Representative Mariani, thank you, Chair Nor, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Jesse Bethke Gomez, Executive Director of Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. We are a statutory nonprofit by way of the federal government and Minnesota statute 268A-11, the Centers for Independent Living. 100% of the people we assist since 1981, over 40 years, are people with disabilities. Over 60% of the people we assist are from diverse BIPOC communities. We're very excited about this project. Uh, just a little bit of background, thanks to the foundation support, we were able to bring on board CRESA to look at a comprehensive strategic facilities plan. We've got the right plan forward. We also looked at conducting a feasibility study um, meeting with so many foundations, individuals, and corporations, and we're excited about the plan that we have for this facility. As Representative Mariani had mentioned, um, MCIL is playing a key role. Um, I was a technical writer for the Direct Care Workforce Plan approved by the uh, Olmsted Subcabinet in March of 2018. Since that time, um, thanks to the Bush Foundation, the Community Innovation Grant, we have been working at the formation of a college credit based curriculum leading to the credential of a certified PCA. We're excited that we believe that this facility to host a state of the art facility so that we can assist PCAs. PCAs have the highest percentage of divorced workers. PCAs as a workforce has the highest percentage of women workers. And this will be the first in America that we bring forth a credential resulting in a certified PCA to help us in the home and community-based service. So we're very excited about this project. Representative Mariani, we're deeply grateful to you uh, for being the author of 3221. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to uh, Chair Noor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vicky Gomez. And I think uh, this uh, committee is very much familiar with the uh, independent living services. We funded through uh, our bill and also uh, DEED is responsible for the federal funding that you get. So very much appreciative of the work that you do in all the centers that are providing the independent living services. Uh, Chair Mariani, if you have any closing, because you are the last bill, unless I'm forgetting anyone uh, who testified, I think we're good. Uh, so Chair Mariani, any closing remarks? Well, that's dangerous. You know, as, as someone who's been here for a while is going to uh, leave, I can just uh, sit and yarn uh, stories. Uh, but no, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Representative Noor, you and other, uh, Chair Noor, you and other uh, chairs um, have been part of a really important movement of opening up our state legislature to the full diversity of our, of our good people of Minnesota, including uh, the various programs and services that they provide to one another and to all people. And so I really want to thank you in the spirit of how you structured this hearing today and how you do your work and how your committee members have embraced that work as well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Mariani. And to the members, any questions? I know there are a few individuals still here. Uh, since there's no any other agenda items, I think with that, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Good projects. Hopefully we can support all the projects we, we can. I think we have the resources. This is the moment for us to step up. Uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.